My name is Peter Cosgrove. I run a company called FutureWise and we look at future work trends and for the next 18 minutes or so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the world of work which will hopefully kind of give us some ideas for how this might actually affect the whole area of RPL. I'm going to start with a quick story. This is Pierre Amidar. He is the founder of eBay. When he founded eBay, uh, the first thing he ever did before that was he sent somebody out an email. He sold them a broken laser pointer. He sent it on email. Somebody responded, I'll buy it. But he felt a little bit guilty. So he went back to the guy and said, look, just to let you know, it's actually broken. And the response he got changed his life because the guy said, that's fine. I collect broken laser pointers. <laughs> and that was when he realized eBay was going to have a future. So what I want us to think about today is the way we think about things is often one of the biggest challenges. We often have to change the way we're actually thinking. Because if you think about the world at the moment, it's very much exponential. We used to think about growth in terms of you know, linear change, 1 to 32. If you think about exponential, that gets you from 1 to 2.1 billion because we're doubling. And that kind of exponential change is actually in every part of our business. So if you think about it, I was told once by my you know, mom, don't get into a stranger's car, don't meet strangers. You know, don't go to a stranger's house. And literally, uh, I think we've got apps for all those things now. So all those old messages and old worlds may not be right. But if you look at the world of how it's changing, the world of banks, we might need bank, uh, banking, but we may not always need banks. What scares me is when we see companies like this. This is a WhatsApp company in Korea who just decided to become a bank. And within six years, it had 35% of the Korean bank accounts. Now, that's not even a business in that sector, and that's how quick it happened. If you think about exponential growth and change, it took airlines 64 years to get to 50 million users. Computers did it in 14 years. Pokemon Go did it in 19 days. And for anyone who's got other kids out there, well, guess what? Uh, Call of Duty did it in a week. So it's probably not that long before we're going to have something that does 50 million new customers in a day. Now, why has it happened? Because of this thing that we saw around COVID, around digital and connectivity. If you ask someone in banking, what do they do? They say banking. If you ask someone in legal, they say we do legal. But if you ask a technology person, they rarely say we do technology. They kind of go, well, we do everything. Uh, Amazon started off as a bookstore, then it became an everything store. Now it's in satellites, prime video, healthcare, pretty much everything it wants to be in because it's frictionless. It's very easy for it to move from one business to another. On top of that, the speed of change for jobs. Kodak at its height had 154,000 workers. Instagram was sold for over a billion with just 19. So it might be a little bit easier to destroy these jobs of the future than it might be to create them. And while we always worry about terminators taking our jobs, it's much more likely to be this whole area of AI. Okay, and these are the sort of headlines we're going to see. And actually, in the headlines right now, we're all hearing about ChatGPT, which is clearly becoming a problem with students putting in their own um, entries and their own essays and so forth. And this is only going to become more of a challenge over time. But it's when this technology starts to connect together. There was a company, Under Armour, who developed a new sneaker, where usually it took them about three years, but they gave it to a supercomputer. It designed a million ideas in a day, because it's a supercomputer. They picked the best idea, and then rather than going to China to create the sneaker, they 3D printed it. So literally a three-year process became a three-day process. So when these technologies start to come together, that's the sort of speed you got. Now, many people in the audience will have kids saying, well, look, I'm not too worried. My kid doesn't want any of those old jobs. They want to be an influencer like Lil McQuella. She's an influencer. She's four million followers. She has opinions. She sells things. She doesn't exist. She's an avatar. So literally, the jobs we didn't even know existed five years ago are already being taken by computers. So that's the kind of speed we need to think about. On top of that, we then had the giant remote work experiment. Remember this three years ago? We started hugging through plastic, going to the cinema and boasting lots of things we thought we'd never do. But really, it was all about this. It was the first time ever we asked ourselves, do we really all have to go in at the same time every morning and come back? Or is there a better way to do it? And really, the future of work and the kind of remote working, this is the picture I always think, because this is what we used to say when we were working from home before COVID. People used to go, well, oh, you're working from home. People kind of didn't believe you could work. But suddenly, we all had to work from home and said, well, I'm very professional, so if I'm able to do it, surely we can work from home. And suddenly, it helped, bureauc it helped with less bureaucracy. It was definitely more convenient. But the problem is, this working from anywhere very quickly became working from everywhere. And we started to get other issues with burnout and lack of ability to kind of take the job and the work and the home life and have them separately. But we did realize that this was so important and we realized that for the world of the future, we're going to have to continue to learn all of these skills that are not just the job we do, but actually all the people we are around. So all these skills that you're learning today, networking, building, influencing, making people laugh, these are long, lifelong skills which are actually just as important. And I think we have to con con continue to consider them. But the challenge we have, and culture is really the challenge companies are having around this. So this whole idea of what do we do if 
There's, you know, culture used to people used to say is what happens when the boss leaves the room. That's the culture of your organization. The problem now is what happens if there's no bot? Well, there's no one in the room. What do we do? Well, the good news is, if there is some good news, is if you type work is into Google, and this is from a number of years ago, this is what people think about work. Now, you might think this isn't great. Well, people say, well, we don't leave work, Peter. We leave our boss. You're right. Well, my boss is probably even worse. So this is what people think about work. And you can try this yourself. The challenge with work is we used to think about the culture as ping pong tables and free food and nice offices. That was never the culture of your organization. Your culture is always your mission, your vision, and your values. These are expressions of culture. But your mission, your vision, and values means you can have a completely distributed workforce as long as you're walking the walk and talking the talk. The problem we have, and this comes back to what we talk about later about some of the challenges you'll have with RPL, is we're very good at policies, we're not very good at practices. So give me an example of this. A number of years ago, a lot of the technology firms were so happy with themselves. We created paternity leave. We've now an equal organization. Men and women can both take time off. And then they realized no men took it. Now, why didn't they take it? Now, they were able to take it. They were getting free money for taking it. But they suddenly looked around the office, saw other men not taking it, and realizing if I take this, it might affect my career. So the problem was not the policy. The policy was perfect. It was the ironclad. It was the practice. So when you look at the things about what the opportunities for RPL are, the question you have to keep asking yourself is not, can we do this, is what is going to be the cultural challenges to do this? Think of all the negatives first before you think of the positives. It's the same with things like distance bias. This is the whole idea of the further you are from the office, the less chance you have of being promoted. This has been around for a long time. People aren't bad people. They don't do this on purpose. They just forget about us if we're not in the office. Here's the challenge. We have a remote workforce. They tell you you're allowed to work from home three days a week, but then you see all the senior executive team going in five days a week. So they're kind of saying one thing, but the main people are going in five days a week. So what are they actually saying? They're saying, well, guess what? You know what? If you really want to get on this office, you'll come into work. Now, they may not be saying this, but these are the unwritten rules. So we end up having more people at home, kind of alone, a little bit isolated, and then they're looking at all these unwritten rules. And these are the practices. So the practices are so, policies are easy. They're just things you write down and you wordsmith and you get right. It's the practice around them we need to focus on. And Veronica mentioned inclusion before, and I think that's very important. And I think pr programs like this are really good to be more equi equitable and more inclusive. But everybody in this room would think they're very inclusive. But if you even think over COVID, it affected women more than men. If parents were both working at home, kids were three times more likely to interrupt their mother than their father, regardless of what job they did. Okay, because of the second shift at home. Now, as I said, everyone here thinks they're inclusive, so I just want to ask you a question. I want you to tell me who your top five friends are, okay? I'm not going to actually ask you, don't worry. I'm not going to say, God, I'm going to have to make John or Jack. <laughs> but just in your head, think about who are my top five friends, okay? If, if you have them in your head, then I asked you to write your name and then their names below you. And then I asked you your age, your gender, whether you're married, do you have a university degree, what's your race, and what's your sexuality? And then you did that for your friends. Would they be a little like you or kind of identical? Like hands up how many people here have more of their top five friends of the opposite gender? More than three out of five are the opposite gender. Two, maybe three. Are we terrible people? No, we're not terrible people. But actually this whole homophily, birds of a feather flock together. But it does make us start to realize when we think we're having all these really good constructive debates, maybe we're just chatting to lots of people who are incredibly like us. So at least we have to challenge ourselves around this. So it's not just gender. Aaron Meyer talks about this from a culture point of view. If you think about different cultures, if you have a Swedish person in charge of an Eastern European operation, Swedes are very democratic, Eastern Europeans are very autocratic. The Swede thinks that uh, you know, the Croatians aren't doing anything, they're very lazy. The Croatians think the Swede can't make a bloody decision because you have two different cultures. Even things like how we speak. In Ireland, we, wait, we almost wait for somebody to finish a sentence before we jump in. In Japan, they can have 20 second pauses, which is why Japanese people say if they come to Ireland, they never get a word in, literally never get a word in. And you think of it from age, if you think of old, people think of old, grumpy, lack of technology. Guess what? Everybody in the room is old if you ask a 10-year-old. Because old is generally 15 years to 20 years older than you. So old is by its nature like that. Even things like this. I spoke to someone who said, I love Zoom calls. Because everybody in a Zoom call is the same height. And that's something you might notice if you were a certain height. So those sort of things matter. And even it's got some challenges. Why is it that people put a logo on their pride flag? Uh, but they don't do it for Black Lives Matter. So even things like equity and inclusion has a long way to go in terms of some of the challenges we have around it. Even apprenticeship programs, you've seen how inclusive they are, and, and Veronica mentioned this with RPL. We have to focus on this, because this is a huge thing for organizations right now, the importance of inclusion. And I think we should put that front and center. 
And if we think about this, then this world of hybrid remote working we're working in, again, we need to start thinking about the people first rather than the policies. In Italy, a number of years ago, they uh, asked people to pay their parking tickets and they just wouldn't. So they sent out angry letters, made no sense. So what did they do? They sent out a very polite letter telling them directions to their local courthouse. And when people actually picture themselves going to court, they very quickly pay their ticket. So it's about us understanding the people, because when we first surveyed people, when we came back to work and said, how many days do you actually want to work from home? What did people say? Five. I'm at home. I never want to come back. Because that's where we were. But if you'd asked people five years earlier, they would have never said, I want to work five days from home. So kind of where we are is the important thing. So we then struggled with this whole idea of do we come in two days a week? Do we come in three days a week? How does it work? And the reality is it doesn't work very well if all different people are coming in different days. If you don't have an anchor day when the whole team are coming in on the same day, it makes no sense. Otherwise, people are saying, I'm just sitting in the office on Zoom calls with everyone else who's not in the office. So all of those things become a challenge. KPMG, when this started, said, oh, we're very, you know, very kind of adult organization. You can come in whenever you want. Within six months, nobody came in. So they said, right, everyone in four days a week. OK, so we have to realize this. And Nick Bloom, who's a global expert in this, said the problem is if you survey people, most people, the most things they want to do is they want to come in no days a week or five days a week. They're the two biggest choices. And that doesn't work very well, which leads to these challenges. But again, from a people point of view, lots of people don't, even still three years later, have a proper setup at home. And it doesn't work very well for them. We also have the younger generation, maybe in flats or apartments, where their kind of computer and the television are literally the same desk. Just think from a health or an unhealthy perspective what that would be like to actually work and then have your social life in the exact same place. But the biggest point is this area of productivity. People say, I work from home because I'm more productive. And I hate to say, you're probably not. I know most people are going to disagree with this. I would say you're working longer hours. I'd say you're getting a lot of tasks done. The problem with the word productivity, everything that counts cannot be counted. If you think about esprit de corps, mentoring, if you think about uh, leadership, if you think about those influencing skills, long-term skills. So for instance, the last time you got an award or won something, wouldn't it be nice with lots of people in the room to congratulate you as opposed to everybody doing a thumbs up on Zoom? We know we can all work from home in our pajamas, but we all are also honest with ourselves that we probably don't do our best work or we haven't bothered to get up in the morning. But probably the number one thing is the first five to 10 years of your life, most of your learning in an office happened with people tapping in the shoulder, you asking people questions, listening in to other calls, hearing what was going on. Do you think those 20 questions you would ask every day as a graduate, you are going to ring somebody 20 times a day? Absolutely out of the question. But the final thing, when you say, I'm more productive at home, you are not an individual. If everybody had that approach, then when you came into the workforce, nobody would have been there to answer your questions or part of the collective. So the key thing is for productivity is you are the one losing out if you never come in and meet with other people because it's those long-term skills, those ones that will, you know, those transversal skills that will live throughout your life, which are the ones that you learn the most throughout your career. Because we have this huge issue of communication now, people literally think it's okay to chat to somebody while they're looking at their phone. We've kind of got all out of control of communication and there's the apocryphal story of the man who chats to a woman, brings her out to lunch, talks about himself for an hour, and at the end of the hour, the woman goes, why are you telling me all this? And he goes, because I want to get to know you better. <laughs> and this is literally what some people think communication is. So we have all these tools, and every time we think we have a problem with communication, what do we do? We add in a new communication device. And Eric Dewan speaks about this amazingly in this book, about how important this digital body language is. If you know your boss and you send them a proposal and they work, send one word back saying, fine, we go, great, off I go. If I've never met my boss, fine could mean fine, or fine, or what, is there a problem? Does my boss not like me? And then if I don't meet this person in the next few months, that starts to fester. But when you think about that, those are real things. We get really upset with WhatsApps and emails and, oh, nobody responded. Nobody responded to my WhatsApp. Did I offend somebody? And she's actually showed some of the issues people have. Like, I'll take it from here, really means you're incompetent. I'm taking over. Gentle reminder means you've forgotten, you idiot. <laughs> By the way, this is the worst two words in the English language to work. Gentle reminder, nobody ever wants that. Oh, gentle reminder, you're so soft and cuddly, I can't even say reminder, okay? So next time you think of saying it, nobody likes it. Please let me know if you've misunderstood. We both know it means, we both know you've misunderstood. And even thanks in advance, if you think about it, thanks in advance, I've asked you to do something, and you've no choice, because I've already thanked you, and you haven't even said you're gonna do it. But these are the things that happen. Why? Because we are so quick on email to get them done. We're in the schoolyard, we're in the lift, we're doing it at a break. We have to spend a lot more time thinking about the importance to the other person because we are not meeting them eight times a day. So those digital connections and communication become more important. Because these Zoom calls, however much and how handy they are, they're convenient, 
but we all know what's happening is, you know, we're staring at somebody's ear, half the people are in the dark, four people are clearly typing something else, and most people aren't listening. Okay? We all know this is happening and it isn't changing, and this is the problem, it's going to get worse when we move to this hybrid world, until the technology catches up. Because you can't have these meetings very well. I was at a hybrid recently, it started at four, what happens at four? You know, the people in the room chat for four or five minutes. The people on the call, I can see them getting more and more annoyed. It's four o'clock, we haven't even started, this is ridiculous. Because that's how a real meeting works. But you actually need somebody who organises that to actually explain that to the hybrid group. It probably won't la go, it started four, it might be a bit later, etc., etc. But these are the challenges we're going to have. Because communication can look like this, this is social distancing in China, but it can also look like that in Paris. Okay? So with a little bit of thought, it can look a little bit better. And really, when it comes to your people, the most important thing is our talent, clearly. You know, this is what we hear at the Great Resignation. And here's the problem, why did we have this? Because more and more people realised work wasn't as much fun anymore. Okay, it was just work. They realized most of the fun part was actually being with other people, connecting and so forth. The bit that doesn't have any productivity value, but is really, really important. And companies that were actually good at hiring and firing in the past will probably still be good because it's about thinking about the individual. Because the number thing people want is this thing, trust. They don't want to be monitored, they want to be checked, they want to be trusted. And this has become the number one metric for retaining staff. Because if they feel trusted, they'll want to stay there. So when you're working from home and someone keeps ringing you, are you working hard enough? That is not good remote working. The challenge as well is we've lost this decompression time. We used to have that lovely time between work and home where we kind of ended our work day and went to our home day. That's lost. Even our kids, if you've kids, you kind of go to work in a suit, you come back, you change out of your suit. Now you're, they see you in the same clothes all day. They don't even know when you're working when you're not working. And we end up saying goodnight to our phone. We blame our kids for being in technology, but guess where they learn it? Well, pretty much from us. We've even seen this whole idea of continuous partial attention, where we're constantly doing two or three things at once, task switching all the time. And why is this important? Because the number one thing that will matter most is this mental muscle that we have, okay? And we're completely over-stimulating it with so many things. And because these skills, these soft skills, or what I like to call them transversal skills, these are the skills I talked about. These are the ones that matter. Okay? These are these skills that will keep you going for the rest of your life, regardless of what job you have if you move industries five times. And these are a lot of the things when we look at ORPL that we're trying to look at, codify, because these are really hard, but they're so important and we all know the importance of them. Because we're going to have this digital world and real world and we're going to have to put them together. And if you think about these people who are working from home, one of the challenges you have to ask yourself, if I can work from home five days a week and never meet anyone, will my job exist in 10 years' time? The biggest difference you have between you and AI and computers is your humanity and all those skills, so don't lose it any time soon. Because Richard Baldwin, who wrote a book, The Globotic, said, on top of that, if you can do your job five days a week, even if a computer isn't going to take it, maybe it'll just go to another country who can do it 10% of the salary you can. So we've got to be very careful around that. So to conclude, many companies are worrying about the kind of future of, kind of the office. Really, it's all about culture. And when it comes to ORPL, we've got to think about the cultural change and not the policy change. Because you're going to have five generations in the workforce. But the biggest thing to realise is they're all people. People just want respect, <coughs> communication, good empowerment. Whatever generation, that's what they want. And to finish with a quick story, this is um, a company called Sweet Valley Farms in California. And just before the pandemic, they were a rescue farm making lots of money from California. And they went out of business practically overnight, because guess what? COVID started, nobody could visit. They lost 100% of their donations. What did they do? They looked up and said, what could we do? Well, let's become a digital business. How does a farm become a digital business? Well, they realized everybody was having these Zoom calls, Zoom drinks, so they set up a company called Goat to Meeting. Yes, well, literally, you could hire out their goat, or their alpaca, or their donkey, and it could be in your Zoom calls. And bizarrely, because we were so starved of any excitement, we all did this. <laughs> And more importantly, it was always five o'clock somewhere around the world. This was a 24-7 business and all they needed was a Wi-Fi and they already had the animals. They ended up making more from this than they ever did from their own business because this is a digital business. So as I say, if Sweet Valley Farm, a small zoo in California can go digital, there's hope for us all. Thank you very much.